Grief begets grief. I thought about this one wet Thursday in December as I sped past a coyote puppy lying on the side of the road. The flash of a dead animal always catches my eye. Skunks, raccoons, and rabbits are common roadkill on San Diego's highways. Coyotes? Not so much. The small pile of gray fur next to a swish of a puddle brought sorrow. I kept my eyes fixed on the road. It was raining. San Diegans drive slower than the speed limit when it rains, but I carry on as normal, albeit in a heightened state of alertness. I gripped the steering wheel tighter. My wheels skimmed over a deep puddle, and I could feel the blade of water spraying the underside of my car. Slow down. <laughs> Death is all around us. One careless glance and it could be all over. I don't fear death the way I used to. I'm not pleased about the lines deepening in my face, but I'm learning to accept them because I hope to grow into old age. As the saying goes, growing old is a privilege denied to many. In the early nights of motherhood, I'd hold my firstborn and rock her to sleep. One particularly brutal night, when I was about to break down from sleep deprivation, came a devastating thought. One day we won't be together. I don't fear death the way I used to, but I weep for my children that if things go the way every parent hopes, I will one day leave. And then a memory hit me. My dad is dead. In January 2020, six weeks before the world went into lockdown, my parents and brother visited me and my young family. My dad and brother, Theo, would be meeting my toddler twins for the first time. My family arrived two days apart, my dad from Bulgaria, my mom and brother from Spain. That weekend, I threw a daytime party for my family and invited all my friends, and my dad entertained all the kids by pretending to be a pirate. It seemed he was his usual self until everyone in the room took turns <laughs> to share how they knew me. I'm the other half responsible for Lauren. Pa wasn't smiling. His skin seemed unusually ashen. He was drinking more than usual. Something was off. A couple of days into my family's week-long visit, Theo confided in me. Pa coughed up blood last month, but he hasn't told anyone. I only know because I happened to call him right as it happened. We were sitting in the front of my parked car. I felt my hand slide off the steering wheel. I told him to get his lungs checked, continued Theo, but he said, don't worry, chum, I know my body. That evening, I studied my dad. He did seem older, thinner, more tired than normal. It wasn't the jet lag, and he had a hacking cough. I thought about confronting him, but decided against it. I didn't want to ruin our week together. I planned to approach him after he was home. We have time. But then the pandemic hit. International borders closed. I sheltered in place, 6,000 miles away from my family. Unable to visit my dad during his last days, or even go to his funeral, I had to find different ways to mourn. I enrolled in a five-week course on when a parent dies with grief expert David Kessler. He shared that most dying people see an apparition of their deceased parents at the time of their transition. It's a spooky but comforting thought that I might be able to keep an eye on my kids after I've left this earth, that my dad might still be keeping an eye on me, that when I die, maybe he'll be waiting to greet me. Sometimes I wonder, what would have happened if I had told my dad that I knew he had coughed up blood? Maybe he'd still be alive. I used to beat myself up about this. I've forgiven myself only because I know now it wouldn't have saved him. Like the mother in the King Solomon fable, I'd rather lose the relationship, not the person. Until the David Kessler course taught me how to navigate grief. With my dad, I thought I'd lost both. Now I know a person is only truly dead when people stop talking about them. Theo and I crisscrossed Europe many times as tweens and teenagers. 
After our parents split up, we were sent to boarding school in England. For the school holidays, we'd fly home to our mum in Spain, then meet our dad wherever in the world he was. In the 90s, he mostly lived in Vienna. Some of my most favorite Christmases were spent bundled up in a city that snows in December. We'd walk the streets in search of bratwurst and almdudler, elderflower lemonade, and when we were older, spicy glühwein, and always roasted chestnuts. I loved strolling through the Chris Kindlemacht with its warm glow of red wooden toys and festive ornaments. But the morbid side of me also wanted to duck into St. Stephen's Dom Cathedral to smell the damp smoke of burning frankincense and explore its catacombs. Scores of feet below ground level were walls of skulls and bones from people who had died in the bubonic plague. Once, to my actual horror, my dad reached through the railings to pluck a fallen skull and waggled it near my face with a ghoulish cackle. <laughs> now he's dead too. Like the anonymous skull, my dad also died in Vienna during a pandemic, but from a personal plague, cancer. It's been raining on and off since Coyote Thursday. Last night, I lay half asleep next to my seven-year-old, my mind wandering as it dipped in and out of consciousness. It kept returning to the last time I saw my dad. January 18th, 2020, I pulled out of my driveway to take him to Old Town Station to catch the train to Los Angeles. We were running late, and in the scramble, I'd left behind my favorite sunglasses, vintage tortoiseshell Chanel's. By the time I realized I would need to shield my eyes from the low rays of a January sun, there was no time to go back home and get them. So I pulled out my emergency pair from my car's center console, blue Ray-Ban knockoffs. A couple of Christmases earlier, on a freezing but sunny afternoon at my dad's home in Bulgaria, he had stared at my Chanel sunglasses and remarked, do you know those look awfully like a pair of sunglasses I once gave your mother. That's because they're the same pair, I winked. My dad looked stunned. I recognized my own intense gaze that I inherited from him. After a long pause of slowly shaking his head in disbelief and with a bemused smile, he deadpanned, I hate you. <laughs> I cackled. His glasses don't last five minutes, and I'd kept this luxury pair safe for 20 years. <laughs> that is, until a couple of months ago. It was chilly outside. As I entered the house, stamping my boots to rid them of excess rain, the Chanel sunglasses slid off the top of my head. I thought I caught them between my breasts, but there was a crack. They'd neatly snapped in half over my heart. I howled. Somehow, it was like losing my dad all over again. I lamented not having worn them on our drive to Old Town. Then a new grief hit me. Why could I remember which sunglasses I was wearing when I hugged my dad goodbye, but not our last conversation? This small detail bothered me, like a snag on a favorite sweater that needs to be pulled back into place. My memories had been eclipsed by the horror of the pandemic. Stuck on the other side of the world, I'd watched him wasting away over FaceTime, unaware of just how sick he was. He delayed seeing a doctor in person because he worried COVID would kill him. By the time he could see a doctor, it was too late. Cancer had crept in and deployed its tendrils. When I suspected he was dying, I still didn't speak up because what good would it have done? I wouldn't have been able to save him or spare anyone their grief. I still wouldn't have been able to say goodbye. Moving images of my last moments with my dad flickered behind my closed eyes like an ethereal projector at a drive-in movie theater. Theo, Pa, and I were milling beside the train tracks. We walked down the platform and back up again. There was a rumble, and here arrived the enormity of the Amtrak train a roar of pewter silver, the clang, clang, clang of the train bell, a shifting of our feet. This is it, isn't it? 
this is the last time I see my dad. It didn't feel like the time I knew I was seeing my great-grandmother for the last time, an invisible question that I needed anxiously between my fingertips. But there was a sense of unease that rippled through my body. The train doors opened. It was time to say goodbye. We hugged. My dad in his denim jacket and jeans, his hair combed in a way that made him look almost cadaverous. Me, also in jeans, my hair scraped into a messy bun that suggests primary caregiver to several young children, and the fake Ray-Bans that colored my vision with a cold mauve light. As my dad and I wrapped our arms around each other for the last time, I heard the exaggerated sound of my brother's iPhone camera shutter and thought, Theo is taking a picture of our last goodbye, and I'm wearing the most awful sunglasses. <laughs> Until I'd lain in the quiet of my kid's bedroom, thinking about the regret of sunglasses, I'd only remembered the milling, the hug, and the train shrinking down the track until it was a speck that disappeared around a curve. But Coyote Thursday had unlocked something within me. My eyes flew open with a resurrected memory of Pa sitting in an upstairs window of the train, waving exaggeratedly, trying to catch our attention. He'd settled in while I scanned window after window for him. It was a throwback to all the many times we'd said goodbye in an airport, protracted goodbyes that Theo and I joked about and wave, and we would turn in showman-like synchronization to give Pa one more wave to push through the discomfort of not knowing when we'd see our dad again. Did any of us know our hug at Old Town would be our last? Did I, really? What did we say? What did we say? I think, well, Lolly, it's been a fantastic visit. It was wonderful to spend time with you and Steve and your bubbers. That's all I know he would have said. And I would have said, I love you, Pa. And he would have told me he loved me. Love you, Lolly. Ah, oh, bless you, love. This I know, even if I don't remember. I was distracted by the fact that Theo was taking a photo. Theo is not a visual documentarian. Certainly not one to photograph a moment like that. He knew it was the last time we'd be together. And I knew. And he knew that I knew that he knew. But Pa's back was turned to Theo. Did Pa know too? And then he was sitting on a train, waving goodbye through a street window. I almost missed him. But I know I stared until the train disappeared down the track because I can still conjure the hollow jolt that rang through my body like a pitchfork quietly humming. This is the last time you see your dad. This is the last time you're seeing your dad. That was the last time you saw your dad. That was vamp first timer Lauren Cross.